Hello, everyone. Welcome to our open forum on information sharing 2.0. We're very excited to discuss this topic, albeit the last day of the IGF, um, and I hope um, that we will have uh, what the open forum is supposed to be, which is an open discussion amongst all of us. So um, let me first introduce the, uh, the session very briefly, um, and our panelists um, will then have a brief discussion amongst the speakers, and then uh, you are very much invited to, um, to discuss with us. Um, my name is Isabel Skierka, I'm the moderator here, and um, I work at the European School for Management and Technology and have a policy background. So I'll be moderating, and now I'll introduce this open forum. So our session today will discuss Information Sharing 2.0 with a focus on cybersecurity, information sharing, and privacy, and how the two might conflict or can be reconciled. As many of you in the audience probably know, sharing actionable information about vulnerabilities, malware indicators, mitigation measures, um, and other information really pr strongly promotes cybersecurity. But as policy and law have evolved, a lot of questions have been raised about the privacy implications of information sharing, and especially for practitioners, this has been this has raised a lot of big questions that they will need to address. There have been legal frameworks such as the EU, EU General Data Protection Regulation or the American um, Cybersecurity Information Sharing Act from 2015, which attempt to tackle these conflicts. Yet a few uncertainties remain. And the goal of this open forum is to discuss ideas and um, best practices about how to um, uh, about information sharing and how to reconcile cybersecurity and privacy in this space. So um, the experience that will be shared here should ideally help and inform global policymakers as well as the global community in um, information sharing, incident response, privacy community as well, to take away some of these best practices and implement them in their own environments. So um, the questions we'd like to discuss pertain to some legal factors um, and consideration behind these leg legislative texts to um, the, uh, how these provisions have been understood and implemented in different sectors, public and private, and in different countries. What are the lessons learned for cyber law and policy? And also, what does that mean for glo global interoperability? Um, in this area. So we have an excellent panel here to discuss these questions today. Um, this session was organized by the Israel National Cyber Directorate and we also have two representatives from um, the Cyber Directorate here. Um, we have Amit Ashkenazi who's um, in the middle here. He is the legal advisor of the Israel National Cyber Directorate in the Prime Minister's office and he is, well, his tasks basically encompass um, deploying the directorate's domestic and international legal policy. Um, he has been active in the field for a long time, um, including also not only security, but also data protection or copyright law e-government issues. And um, before he also held roles um, amongst others at the Ministry of Justice at the Israeli Law Information and Technology Authority. Then, um, he is, uh, we are also joined by Riot Yamen. He, she also works here on the very right. She also works at the Israeli National Cyber Directorate. And as such, she provides legal advice on issues pertaining to international law and cyber law and is responsible for the directorate's international agreements. So um, we have both this uh, domestic and international perspectives here on the panel. Prior to that, she worked at the um, Ministry of Foreign Affairs. And here to my very right, um, we welcome Andrew Cormack. Andrew um, has been around in the community for a long time already. Um, he joined the UK's National Research Network 20 years ago to run the computer emergency response team there. 
And for the past 15 years, he has had a wider remit looking at regulatory and security issues relating to the use of networks and data in education. And Andrew has a very interdisciplinary outlook here, um, knowing a lot both about the um, technical side of incident response, the practical sides, and also uh, the legal issues that he himself often has to solve. <laughs> so, um, and we'll start with Andrew, who will um, now, uh, yeah, give us an overview a little bit of, of these challenges that he has faced and um, his experience. <clears throat> Thanks, Isabel. Le learn to use the technology. Um, I started by thinking what would happen if only bad guys shared, if the law really didn't allow incident response teams, vendors, researchers to share data, which seems to be a perception sometimes. We'd end up with fewer antivirus solutions. We'd end up with no coordinated releases about vulnerabilities, because all of those involve sharing. So your personal devices, whether that's your laptop or your phone or your baby alarm or your security camera or your coffee machine or your child's speaking doll, are all going to be vulnerable. On the internet, anything vulnerable gets compromised very quickly, um, typical times about an hour or two uh, for a vulnerable device. And because you've said good guys can't share, not only can nobody prevent things becoming vulnerable, they can't tell you when they have so become vulnerable. They can't tell you when you have actually been successfully attacked either. So the state where all of those devices are listening to you, perhaps even becoming you, is permanent because nobody can warn you. You almost certainly can't detect from inside a laptop that the laptop has been compromised. And it struck me that City in Berlin is probably about as appropriate a place as there could be to imagine what that state might be. I was actually in the uh, GDR Museum in Leipzig yesterday, which is absolutely fascinating, and they have some of the cabinets of Stasi files. And the idea of having most of the laptops in the country available for compromise, I think, just would blow their minds. So that's certainly not a state that leads to privacy. So what we need is a law that is part of privacy law. I think Isabel said there's a conflict, well, hinted there's a conflict between privacy and security. I don't think there is. Very strongly, I think the security of our devices is a key part of our online privacy. So I want permission that is part of a strong privacy law, not a security law or a network law or a national security law. So there's none of this suggestion of, oh, we have to balance this law against that one. It needs to be clear so that CERT teams that I used to work with, still work with, can actually get on with protecting the internet and not worrying about whether they need the attacker's permission to share data. You know, I, I've heard serious suggestions of we can't share this data that, about being under attack without the attacker's consent. Uh, no, you're not going to get it, so that, that has to be wrong. Um, but also limited, so we only need to share, we only has strong limits on what we share related to what the threat to users are. Uh, it definitely shouldn't be you know, blasting information about everywhere. It should be very targeted sharing what's necessary, what's of most benefit. And one that I think is most often missed is it needs to be a broad scope. So even in Europe, we're running into a bit of a risk at the moment with the new e-privacy regulation because that will cover only network operators and will give them different privacy rules from websites or peers to. And that creates barriers to sharing because if I want to share data with you and you can do stuff with that data that I can't, then I'm going to be quite um, nervous about try trying to do that. But in fact, looking at recital 49 of the GDPR, which we, we could have up on the screen behind us but uh, as the theme for this, I think it's pretty close to that requirement spec. I'll leave the what we can do better for later, because there, there are a few things. It's not perfect, but it, it's pretty good. But ultimately, I think what we have to th remember is this point that security people protecting the network, protecting computers, and privacy people are very much on the same side because both of us need to keep information secure from bad guys. 
otherwise our main desire isn't met. And what greater privacy breach can there be than having somebody else in control of your laptop or your smart home? And I really hope that we don't get into a position where the law forces us to, uh, to do that. Thanks. Um, Amit, do you want to weigh in a bit more on the legal context as well? Thank you. So, um, indeed, uh, the way we approach this in the discussion, the evolving discussion between technologists and lawyers, is uh, a need to balance and the need to create a legal framework which gives certainty and allows cyber defenders to do their job. And this is the, the, the constant dialogue that we're having. I'd like to share a bit of the mechanics of the legal analysis when we approach these issues. Um, I, I should state that in Israel, privacy is a constitutional right and also a right, we, we have a data protection uh, law. We have even been found adequate by the EU. So for sake of uh, clarity, I will use the EU uh, jurisprudence as my, uh, as my uh, reference point. So basically when we look at the uh, uh, if you like double clicking this message of how how do we really help the network defenders with the law and balance between uh, privacy and other issues first of all we need to take into account that privacy law uh, and the GDPR itself talks about on the one hand protecting individuals but on the other hand enabling free movement of data so we are constantly balancing and this is a core concept in data protection law since the 1980 OECD privacy principles the need to enable information flows yet um, uh, protect from unintended harms to privacy and when we do the analysis for cyber security means usually uh, it's useful to look both at recital 49 style uh, uh, rules and also I would uh, say article 6 of the GDPR relating to the legitimate interest and without going into too much legalese the three main elements that we look at there talk about the legitimacy of the pursued interest so I think by this time in the discussion we agree that cyber security is very very important and that uh, it enables protecting privacy as a core concept within the GDPR itself and also it enables protecting other important uh, societal functions and interests uh, on computer networks. And then we need to go to the second test, which is where the dialogue with the technologist is the most fascinating. I'm using a diplomatic word here. <laughs> the issue of necessity. So the question that we ask ourselves as lawyers giving legal advice to technologists is, is this the, te the, the technical measure that will support the mission and uh, is it completely necessary? For instance, do we need to retain all logs of a, a specific uh, device in order to understand what's going on and to be able to uh, later, if we have a, a breach, God forbid, replay the security cameras, which the log files are the example of. And finally, the things that lawyers uh, need to do is the balancing act. So we need to look at the context uh, of what we're doing and what are the risks to privacy of the intended technical uh, uh, operation? And uh, is it, if you like, net positive? Uh, and and uh, this, in this uh, area, there is another interesting interplay between cybersecurity and privacy because one of the factors that we take in is the mitigation strategies, which is actually how we can reduce the risk to privacy that we have identified. And in this sense, we take cybersecurity thinking and, if you like, turn it against itself, using cybersecurity measures to audit ourselves, to make sure that people are only accessing what they need, uh, using automation and other technical measures basically borrowed from cybersecurity itself to protect privacy within um, this discussion. And the final thing that um, I've seen in, in this discussion, both with private sector lawyers in Israel and uh, corporate counsel and other government bodies, is the need to have a better understanding of the different elements of this analysis so that we can have a, a more informed discussion uh, which goes from the high uh, level principles which we all agree upon to pragmatic solutions. And this ultimately, I think, uh, supports the defenders and reduces the risk 
to them and their activity, and they, it allows their stakeholders, managers, in-house counsel, others, to be more supportive of the mission. Okay, thank you. I mean, we'll continue with Riot uh, right away for the uh, international perspective and how that can be um, inform the the debate internationally. Thank you, Isabel. Um, so, hello, hello everybody. Uh, I would like to share with you a pragmatic point of view based on, on my discussions with uh, legal advisors to CERT and to cybersecurity authorities from across the world when we try to come up with the educate framework for this uh, cross-border cooperation. And when we do that, the question is, uh, that we are facing with is what productive cooperation and cross-border collaboration might look like. And very soon the discussion turns to the question of how to create a common basic ground for sharing of information. Just as uh, Andrew said, when you understand that in the other side you have basic common ground that enables you to trust the other side, um, it makes the sharing of information much more um, uh, convenient and comf comfortable. Um, so it then th that we realize that we are basically facing similar dilemmas, but we're subject to different legal framework and different domestic and different domestic laws. Um, and as you're probably well aware, uh, legal mechanism, uh, regular legal mechanisms such as legal aid that uh, is supposed to try and deal with it at transformation of information aren't effective when it comes to cybersecurity. Um, so as a result, we do understand that we have a different role as legal advisors in this area. And we often uh, see ourselves more as, um, as the backseat lawyers. We understand that we uh, need to lower the, wa uh, the walls and build the bridges between the tech community and the government by creating common language that will enable us uh, this uh, tr uh, transformation of information. And I think that Recital 49 is a good start for developing domestic rules that would be interpreted and implemented in similar ways among state. And by that, it might create the trust and confidence that needed in order for us to enable this uh, sharing of information. And this, of course, promotes cybersecurity and serve privacy. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Um, I would like to uh, ask one of you, um, just uh, before we start the open discussion, um, it still sounded quite easy f from what you described. It sounded like, oh, you know, everything kind of, um, it's clear that uh, information, security and privacy um, are obviously related and information sharing works well, um, we'll respect privacy, right? And and we have Recital 49 of the GDPR, which, by the way, basically says that, um, of course, you should uh, respect uh, data protection rules, but since um, information sharing of threat information is so important, um, there are exemptions in this field. So, um, well, just to, maybe you can read it out or something um, again. But I would like to ask you, like, where are the actual conflicts and like, what should we practically do here? I think this was still a bit academic in the discussion. Thank you. Come on. Um, I think one of the challenges is, particularly when working with government teams, that they often, they often have a basis in government governing law. So the, there can be a barrier there, either legal or in perception, uh, because quite a lot of national CSERTs now sit as part of the National Security Agency. And that's a slightly worrying look to those of us outside. And they, in that position, you have to be really strong in presenting, we are a CERT we are not part of the security agency. Um, I think there is still huge misunderstanding, in fact, 
ignorance of Article four, of Recital 49. I think a lot of people don't know it's there. Yeah, can you maybe just summarize it again? Yeah, Recital 49. Um, the GDPR has the, the important bit. Recital 49 says that um, basically processing of personal data that is necessary this is horrible. Um, it's going to open it up to check I've got it right. Uh, personal <laughs> processing of personal data that is necessary in order to protect the security of, of networks and data may be a legitimate interest of a very wide range of entities. And the interesting words there are legitimate interest because that's actually a technical term in legal sense which takes you to one of the Article 6 justifications for processing data that Amit mentioned. And in fact, it's Article 6.1f, and it is the most protected form of processing um, personal data because it's in Article 6, you, so 6.1f, you have to say this is necessary, so you have to say what I'm doing, the information sharing I'm doing, is the least intrusive way there is to achieve this function. Purpose is legitimate, which I think Recital 49 crosses off. And then even if the sharing is necessary, if the risk it creates to individuals' um, fundamental rights, that's not quite right, um, but personal fundamental rights, not just privacy, so any rights, freedom of speech, if my sharing of data creates a perception that I am big brother, so people start changing how they use my networks, I have to say, no, the rights of the individuals override the sharing that I want to do. Um, I did, gosh, about 10 years ago, write a toolkit for how to look at information sharing and say, what data do we want to share if it's an IP address, that's probably less sensitive than if it's a real name or an email address, because an IP address is less reusable. Um, am I sharing it with directly towards the person who could benefit from this, or am I sharing it more widely? So the risk there is a bit higher if I'm sharing it more widely. Am I sharing it within an, a community that has agreement either through shared laws or you know, a, a self-appointed uh, agreement on how it will process data, how it will use data, only use data for the purposes of protecting systems and networks and not offensively. Again, sometimes working with government, it's a bit tricky as to if I share this information, if I share a vulnerability with you, and several governments are now being really good about this and publishing the terms on which they will use knowledge of a vulnerability either to fix the vulnerability or they might keep it in reserve in case they want to hack another nation's systems. And there's a lot more openness about that process, which I think is really good. Um, but working with government certs, that's always a, a slight extra risk factor. Mm -hmm. So I think using that kind of analysis, the other tool we've used, um, Amit mentioned using turning security tools against themselves, is we've actually turned the full legal tool, so we've done a data protection impact assessment for our security operations center for a network that has 18 million people on it, all universities, colleges, most schools in the UK. So we can see an awful lot of data, if we want, if we need. Uh, and we've done a DPIA, and that is public, um, and has been shared with information commissioners and the European Commission, and you're very welcome to read it. Uh, and that came out as, yes, you are. We, we tweaked a couple of things about what we were doing, but it, it was a really good learning experience. Well, that's a very good takeaway, I think, as well, that we might come back to. Um, would you like to say something as yeah, well? Yeah. yeah. I, I mean, I, I, I take your criticism that this is somewhat academic in the sense that we're having this discussion between people that have invested a lot of time to understand what the real issues are. And uh, this is part of the divide between technologists and lawyers that we've seen for a long time, right? Uh, the technologists usually don't want the lawyers to meddle in their affairs. Um, and what we are trying to do is uh, reduce the tension and uh, look at uh, areas where there are less uh, heavy duty issues that we deal with. In, in this context, uh, one concept I want to add is uh, the issue of accountability that we have now in, uh, as a core part of uh, data protection regulations. 
which requires anyone doing these types of procedures with information having processes in place to make sure that he's doing it in a proper manner. And um, this serves as a framework to analyze uh, these issues. Uh, data protection in general is, uh, is, a, is a complex issue because it involves values and context and societies. Uh, what we are trying to do here is bring this type of analysis to show that some of this, these elements are less controversial and maybe easier to grasp so as to make them more accessible both to technologists and to lawyers. And in that manner, maybe uh, enabling um, or stopping negative results, which we have seen sometimes, whereas either technologists don't ask the lawyers and do things which we like less, or they don't ask the lawyers and don't do anything because they're afraid of the law. So uh, this is something that is useful in this type of uh, conversation. Okay, one last quick intervention before we open it's up the very point. quick one for both sides. Don't expect yes, no answers in this field. Um, as with everything else, this is about risk management. You are relaxed about risk management when it comes to managing computers, using computers. Don't insist on is this compliant or not, because the answer will almost certainly be it is not known. Um, we can give you an estimate of how likely you are to get into trouble um, on both sides. But um, one of the things that I found really my technical colleagues struggled and still struggle with is that they come to me and say, can I do this? Expecting me to say yes or no. And I come back with a, what I call a convincing story. So if anybody asks, this is why I think, and this I think is part of the accountability that uh, Amit mentioned. Now, I, we have thought about this. We have looked at what we're doing. This is how we would justify it. And that, to me, is a much better thing to provide data subjects with than a statement of, we're compliant. Um, look at compliant with ISO, various ISO standards, and work out just how reassuring those are. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my convincing, claim that my convincing stories are more reassuring to uh, users than that. So. Yeah, thanks so much for that practical insight also by the end. Um, no, yes, uh, no yes and no answers. Um, I'd like to open up the floor to everyone to um, please come forward if you have um, anything to contribute or questions, arguments to make, please. Um, in the meantime, <laughs> you are still free to contribute something um, while uh, people walk up to the mic. Someone else? Okay. Someone. Um, Hi, um, I'm Elliot. I'm from. Uh, I'm here with ISOC IGF Youth Ambassador Program. Um, I'm from Australia, and I'm just wondering: um, is there any other approaches in national laws? I understand we're talking a lot about GDPR Article 49. Is there approaches in other national laws similar for cybersecurity purposes that maybe aren't so based on the GDPR, and are they quite different? Thank you. So, so um, basically, and this, thank you for the question, because it, it enables uh, uh, recalling that the basis for this conversation, which is based on sharing of information and based on trust, is that we need a common language to discuss privacy. So uh, as the world is becoming more and more uh, driven by privacy laws, the GDPR, but uh, uh, there are the OECD privacy principles, and Australia has a privacy law, Israel has a privacy law, we have a common terminology to discuss. And the actual um, legal domestic solution to give clarity for these types of situations is different. So in, in Europe, this stems from Recital 49 in the GDPR. In the US, as uh, Isabel mentioned, this is written in the cybersecurity law. And um, in Israel, we are developing this uh, both under privacy and under our cybersecurity law as something that we're doing. And basically, uh, you could imagine that maybe uh, the European Data Protection Board one day or other form of data protection regulators could issue a statement giving guidelines along these issues and thus 
taking the, the conversation further. The, the question from a technical legal point of view, does it have to be in a law or not, is, is another issue. For our international interfaces, it is definitely more helpful. Thank you. Uh, hello, I'm, I'm Mark from Microsoft. I'm in the Privacy and Regulatory Affairs Group, and I'd like to talk about um, certainty and risk management. So as an example, um, you're probably aware of the, the who is identifiers in the domain name system. So what we're seeing is that, you know, a company like Microsoft, we can spend a lot of resources and have uh, lawyers working closely with technologists and coming up with, um, as you say, defensible, credible stories, and we can manage our own risk. And our level of confidence is, at this time, fairly high that the things that we believe we should do are things that can lawfully be done. In the ICANN environment, in the domain name system environment, the, the actual data controllers of, of the who is data, they are not in a similar situation. They are smaller companies. They have less exposure to data processing law in general. They are certainly not applying as many resources to GDPR as, uh, as we are. And when we share our interpretations with them, uh, their reaction usually comes in two forms. Civil society says, well, Microsoft obviously has some sort of an agenda, and therefore we should disregard their inputs. And the data controllers say, well, I, don't, I can't really verify your claims because I have fewer resources, and if you're wrong, you could withstand the fines and the defenses, whereas we could not. And I think we've seen this with uh, uh, the Ministry of Justice in the Netherlands, who you know, asked us to review the way we did data processing uh, in Office 365. So we handed over our DPIA, we worked with them for several months, and then they came to the conclusion that, um, that we were reliable and they should be our customer again. So, so back to, I'm sorry, that was, a, that was a long preamble to the actual question. Uh, given that legitimate interests are sort of subjective, so you have a risk, well, this is, this is the situation. Who is performing the balancing test? This is really the, the trick. And I've seen some advice, not our advice, that uh, it really comes down to, uh, you know, if you're comfortable with this, then it is probably lawful like this. And, and what I'm seeing is that given, um, uh, based on the comfort level, of, of the various data controllers, the responses can be very, very different uh, to the point where the whole access regime is now completely uh, unpredictable. And I'm wondering, how can we better test this law? How can we create um, concrete cases so that people can look at them and say, um, I, I believe that my story is credible, not just because I've applied a lot of reasoning and logic and expensive lawyers and whatever to it or gone to Brussels and asked questions, but simply because there's a case law that I can point to. Uh, how do you think we can move forward that situation so that people can have more confidence? Thank you. I, I fear the, the case lawship has sailed because ICANN has already sued one of its own registrars and has lost <laughs> on that. Uh, so there is actually case law pointing the other way. The problem with um, who is data is that ICANN has not taken the very strong hints over 15 years from the European, sorry, from the Article 29 Working Party in the European Data Protection Board that they should split the security function from the intellectual property rights function. And there is a pretty easy and obvious case, again, based on legitimate interest in security in Recital 49, the fact that the EDPB has now said, if you don't have a monitoring function and the reason for you not reporting a breach was that you didn't have a monitoring function that was able to detect the breach, that can be an additional fine. I mean, how, how strong a, um, a vote in favor can you want? Um, that's such a long sentence, I've forgotten where it was going. Um, but I, I think there's a really strong case for, yes, I know. The security side, I think, is should be a no-brainer. 
Um, I have written a, an analysis of, I think, is it actually called the Berlin Group? Are we circling back around here again mm. of the data protection regulators? It is. Okay, this city has a, yeah. a lot going on. Um, the Berlin Group wrote a paper on wow. their problems with who is data. Uh, and I wrote a response to that for, for incident response. Not for law enforcement, not for rights holders. They can get their own responses. Um, I suspect the best way out would be to get something from the EDPB saying that for secure, you know, again, since they are pushing the privacy and security side, mm. it might be possible to, for them to give a, a, an even stronger hint. They've already given very strong hints that they are really pretty relaxed about who is being used for security purposes. Uh, th this is also our interpretation, but really you're, you're proving my point. You are very comfortable with this situation. I am very comfortable mm. with this situation, and yet the data controllers, uh, they still are not, and they, yeah. they require some convincing, and, and I'm just wondering how we should put that forward. Uh, and then just as a side note, uh, I think it is no longer uh, a clean split between intellectual property and cybersecurity since um, you know, trademarks and intellectual property are good bait for phishing. And so we find that very, very often our trademarks are being used in phishing scams. And so I, you I know, think there, there, there is a, a certain amount of overlap which is clouding the, the water again. We, you know, people I'd, saying Microsoft has their own agenda. I'd, I'd use the yeah. phrase "shooting yourself in the foot" if you do that. <laughs> Stick to the "we need we need who is data" to be able to track down the history of registrations. Show them the problem is finding two two entities: one, somebody who is willing to do the showing, mm -hmm. and two, some authority that is willing to have a look at the showing. And I can unfortunately has rather take out a, an awful lot of the options for those. Um, and I don't, I don't have a lot of confidence we're going to get this sorted anytime soon. Um, I think, uh, as I say, it, the problem has be, been being, well, not just the problem, the problem and the solutions that the regulators have been offering has been being ignored for 15 years uh, while we went further and further down the wrong path. And maybe it'll take 15 years to get back to the right path again, but looking at some of the stuff that academics and increasingly some of the more advanced um, response teams are doing with who is data, with DNS data, um, it's becoming all uh, among the best sources. I used to say flow data was the best sources for finding bad stuff. I'm now seeing papers that convincing convince me that actually Flow data finds an event very quickly once it's happened. DNS data can actually find preparations for an event, and that's really exciting. Um, so at some point, somebody's got to notice that and say, maybe we need this data. The, the best DNS stuff doesn't actually need who is that I've seen. Of I, course, the researchers yes. have basically given up on who is for a decade as well. So. Mm. Thank you. But, I'll be very short. Um, I think that this discussion um, exactly exemplifies what, we want, what type of discourse we want to have. And the question is what social institution we have to give us the most clarity. And uh, so this is one takeaway. And I, I note Microsoft's uh, position in having different players play on, on, on the playing field. And I, I don't want to specifically discuss this issue, but I, this is exactly what we want to show here, that there is a need for a rational discussion among policymakers because that way we can agree uh, socially what is the net positive solution. And the last thing that uh, Andrew mentioned, uh, I think is an excellent example of the way we need this uh, framework to be dynamic because now we can have an expert opinion saying DNS data is necessary for this type of incident mitigation. Maybe we couldn't have said that several years ago and this now pushes the need for reformulation of the balancing exercise. Um, uh, and, and in that sense, I, I completely agree with the need to delineate purposes. This is uh, something which is super important. Otherwise, the balancing act doesn't fit out correctly because you're balancing different interests. And, and that's my technical legal note to your analysis. Thank you. 
Liana coming from North Macedonia, from the Western Balkan region. So I was wondering where is the Convention 108 in all of this um, policy framework since the Western Balkan region is not part of the EU as a country members of the European Union and we are members of the Council of Europe. So where do you think this would fit within all of the regul fr uh, regulation framework you have mentioned? Thank you. So, so uh, I think that uh, without getting too technical, I think that in general, having these types of high-level concepts, uh, they can be uh, ingrained within the Council of Europe uh, 108 Convention, either through uh, the analysis of what processing is, uh, is uh, legitimate and also maybe in other, I would say, safeguards that enable processing uh, for uh, protection of important interests. So it has a, maybe a different uh, connecting points, Council of Europe uh, Convention 108, and actually we took uh, the opportunity here in the IGF to discuss with the Council of Europe colleagues if they can help in this, uh, in this uh, journey of clarifications and putting out a similar sort of statement and uh, hopefully this is something they will consider. They are looking at the way information security is relevant in all of the Council of Europe's documents. Thank you. My name is Serge Dross. I'm the chair of the Forum of Instance Response and Security Teams. I'm kind of happy to see that, that data protection laws acknowledge the need to share information for security purposes. So that's kind of a silver lining on the horizon. But I actually do see very dark clouds, and those clouds are called sanctions. So be pretty good sharing kind of data among our friends, but we have an increasingly hard time actually talking even to people that are in someone else's garden, so to speak. So there's a number of countries we not talk to. There's an increasing number of organizations that, that in first we had to exclude, we can't even talk to. And I wonder if, if we need to go down a path where we say this information sharing for security reasons is actually so important that it should be exempt like medical or humanitarian aid from legal frameworks or international legal frameworks. I'm exaggerating, I'm not a, a lawyer, but I'd like to hear your opinion on that. Oops. I dare move again. Um, yeah, I, I think they just to agree that I think the sanctions thing is a mess, particularly because there was a paper and some research done just a few years ago basically congratulating the incident response community for managing to work <coughs> in ways that diplomats can't. And that paper was trying to encourage the share, you know, the continuation, they call it science diplomacy, apparently it's, it's a thing. Um, the paper was trying to encourage support for that and what I've seen in the last year is, is actually, as you say, the reverse, that this important stuff has been drawn instead out of science diplomacy and into, call it real diplomacy. Um, and yeah, the internet is global. There's, there's no benefit in not sharing incidents and not sharing information. I think we have to find a solution. But I don't know what it is. <laughs> I mean, I mean we, we, can, we can say that uh, this is part of the dilemmas of having a global internet more and more important and more and more relevant to other international issues which affect this dialogue, I, I guess. Hi, uh, I'm Hamdul Arba from Afghanistan. Uh, I'm working with the Access to Information Commission. Our, our job is to ensure that public should have access to data, to government data. Uh, the problem we have there is an is a issue of uh, either deliberate uh, manipulation, because okay, data should be protected, but it's manipulated politically, they say, when you say protection of data, it's a confidentiality of the data. Well, our job is that, because in the law, we have one of the best law, the Center for uh, uh, Democracy Canada, they, they have ranked us one of the best law, so even everyone living on the globe should have access to the Afghan government data. 
but they're the officials, the politicians in certain government entities. They consider this, okay, we have to protect this data, cybersecurity, this and that. They uh, do not share it with the public. And then it becomes a big challenge for us to push them to share it with the public because everyone should have, it's a human right. Just a comment, thank you. I think that it, it's important uh, for our scoping of the issue, and thank you for that last comment, to, to say that when we look at uh, our mission, it is to secure the network and the information and let others and other, I, I would say, uh, policy regimes, legal regimes, uh, institutions in our country deal with the issue of content, if at all. So it's very important for us that we uh, protect the infrastructure and the information in a horizontal manner, whereas we may have other vertical regimes looking at and discussing the difficult value questions that apply in different contexts. For instance, copyright versus free speech or intellectual property versus free speech, defamation, incitement, etc. So our mission, and this makes our lives a bit easier as the legal advisors to this, to our organization, is we do not deal with the content issues at all. Rather, we focus on the machine readable things that make the internet and the computers work. And in that sense, our lives are easier than our, of our colleagues in other organizations. Quick observation, I think Europe has just set up that problem because in addition to the GDPR, there is a very new, uh, I think it's a regulation on the free flow of data, which is supposed to be very much your um, issue of ha having access to government data. And the definition of the border between personal data and non-personal data in that is very unclear. So I think we are running rapidly into that problem, uh, that somebody will have to sit down and say, actually, at what point does something become personal data and therefore covered by the, um, the GDPR type regime where, yes, confidentiality and strong controls apply, um, as against the uh, open government regime. The other area I'm hitting it personally is because I work for Research Network, there's a big push to open research data and trying to make available uh, for reproducibility the raw data. Again, that can bump into at what point does that raw data become personal data? And there again, I think there's, there's going to be big fragmentation even within Europe because the, the research parts of the GDPR are largely given to individual member states. So I, I, I agree with you, there's a problem. I think a lot of countries and regions are going to be needing to look at it soon. <laughs> yeah, if I may, I mean, even when it comes to person, like they get some of the officials, like in a span of one or two years, you know they don't have a penny and all of a sudden they become millionaire. So it, it becomes a concern. If I'm a government official, public should know. It's their human, I mean, it's their right to know. And then know in a community that he had nothing and all of a sudden he became rich. So uh, some of the data, even if it's personal, but that personal is defined in the law that he's a government official. And when it becomes a government official, data should be shared. So, uh, and it's an issue of corruption within the government entities. That's why they manipulate this protection of data is confidentiality. When you say you protect in our organization certain data, even in security, according to our law, uh, there are certain things that cannot be shared, movement of soldiers, etc. But uh, what you procure for the soldiers, that should be disclosed and there should be a proactive disclosure so people know what they're doing it. Uh, that, that's a concern there. Thank you. Yeah, but the, again, there are big differences. It, the, the, the cultural thing, that in the, in the Nordic countries, you're, I think it's the tax that public officials pay is regarded as public. I'm getting a couple of nods. Um, uh, salary even salary sometimes, okay. Um, whereas in the UK, what your salary is, is no, you know, no way am I going to disclose that. So even in countries that we think are very, you know, we, we regard as very similar, well, I, I, I do, um, despite our recent issues, um, it's, it's a very big cultural difference as to how um, pay for job is, is um, 
considered. Uh, and we, we had a big scandal over expenses for members of parliament several years ago, which some people are now tracing distrust in politics right back to. Thank you. I think that was um, another fascinating point. I think there's also some discussions about this topic at the IGF. I believe there's a dynamic coalition, so maybe um, on publicness, um, because that might relate a little bit to what you just um, pointed to. Um, since we don't have that much time left, I would like to move the debate back a little bit to the core question of, um, of our discussion, which um, pertains very much to the sharing of, uh, of information, uh, security information, threat intelligence, and so on. Um, we've, I think we've made some progress um, here uh, in the discussion talking about certain approaches that we might take um, to move this issue forward to find some uh, agreement beyond um, the European Union framework or the US's framework. Um, we've talked about the Council of Europe and that you already had discussions with them. So I would like to um, to ask you again, like in a um, final round and also all participants here in the room, what would be your concrete suggestions, maybe steps forward, um, both practically, but also, um, but also on the conceptual level, like the legal level, technical level. So I think that uh, uh, we need to uh, embrace the uncertainty that we're seeing. I, there was a, a great report discussed this week in the IGF by the Internet and Jurisdiction um, uh, team that talks about cross-border legal challenges on the Internet. Uh, as one of the next uh, big thing that, that will affect us. And in this area, this may be too dangerous to our cooperation in, in cybersecurity. So we need to embrace the differences and continue this uh, dialogue where uh, it's a domestic dialogue between security experts and lawyers. And it needs to have uh, connecting points internationally. So this was the point of having this discussion here because we hope to show that when you analyze the question according to uh, recognized uh, principles, you can reach uh, rational solutions which can support cyber defenders. So I would, uh, I would suggest to countries that are developing their data protection or cyber security legislation to embrace this issue and uh, look at the global best practices and try to make their laws interoperable. They don't have to uh, reach the same uh, value solution that maybe the EU has had or that Israel is going or the US because this is local. But if this, there's a common denominator between jurisdictions, then this is a useful thing um, for a cooperation. And uh, I, I, I note very seriously uh, the question from the audience coming from Microsoft about the level of legal certainty and how we should get it, which institution is the best to do that. And this is something which is also uh, country specific. Doing law and technology for a long time, I think that the law should be more open-ended and there should be institutions that can dynamically uh, interpret it. But I take into account that someone, uh, as Microsoft noted, may think that this is subjective. And so this is a challenge we need to deal with. Um, so this is what, what I suggest. Well, thank you. Um, so maybe I'll just add that the tech community is sharing information all the time. They have their own rules in order to make sure that the other side that received the information um, preserve the information in the way that, th that suits them. Uh, the TLP protocol is an example. And when we, as the international lawyers that give legal advice to government, uh, need to think how we cooperate now with another government and need to basically create the legal framework for this cooperation to continue, um, we need to make sure that we are respecting those rules and this language that the tech community already created and adding another layer and if we understand that on the other side, there is this legal framework that respect, for example, privacy. Uh, it, it could uh, promote the cooperation between the tech community and also help us getting agreements between governments. So. 
If I can, a really pr concrete proposal, and it may look mm -hmm. deeply scary, get a lot of coffee, get your legal team and your technical team in a room for a half a day and do a data protection impact assessment. You will learn a lot about what each other do. Um, I, I was in a privileged position because I have done both. Our data protection officer's head exploded. Uh, some of, the, some of the, the techies' heads exploded as well. But we've ended up with a document which reassures us that we are doing stuff right and safe. It reassures, it reassures our customers and it reassures others that they can share data with us and that we will use it in the spirit in which they intended. Yeah, if I may, I, I'm wondering about, um, I think there's a big issue here about capacity building as well and information sharing among, not like technical information sharing, but um, sharing information among the communities. Um, for example, I wonder whether first the Forum of Incident um, Security Response Teams um, actually set sets up some working group in this space or whether there's any other kind of international um, fora where you can do that, whether there's like, um, sharing platforms for sharing information. I think those would also be, um, yeah, concrete uh, s points to start from. For example, if you shared your information, yeah. Um, we, our legal advisor is actually sitting on a panel, so he he doesn't really know he's the official legal advisor, but that's. We're very much happy that, that he supports us so much. What we do, though, is that we come up with frameworks that allow us to automatically share data in a legal way. So the big challenge that the technical community has is the amount of data is growing at an enormous rate. And we're pretty good in sharing person to person, but that doesn't scale. So we actually have a special interest group that works on the standards that allows machines to share information This appropriate sharing rights and, and all of this stuff implemented. And uh, having said that, I, I do feel that the tech community needs to reach out more to the policymaker community, to the, to the legal community. The, a lot of the tech members of the tech community are very reluctant to talk to anyone that speaks a different language. And that is a challenge we're working on. Okay, thank you so much. Does any one of you want to have a last word or <laughs> about this? Um, so I think what um, we have a few seconds left. The one thing I would take away also. Um, oh yeah. Okay, really fast, please. Oops. Thank you. My name is Alejandro Pisanti. I am from the National University of Mexico. Pleased to meet you in person. Um, I'll. Bringing briefly something I've uh, mentioned also in, uh, in, in other panels, the, the origin of the rules that we are dealing with, the, the ones you are now so struggling so hard uh, with, especially in the certs first, etc. community, uh, is coming from different regimes. Uh, we are not plugged into some of those. We have the multi-stakeholder regime, which we have slowly built, uh, still fighting, struggling to make it adequate uh, to give the mechanisms the right kind of teeth, accountability mechanisms, and so forth. And on the other hand, we have the multilateral, which is where rules like the GDPR are coming from. And we have the GGE and so forth. We have to get our um, technical community engaged so that the rules are implementable and to engage to governments so that they do GGE and that kind of stuff in a way that can actually be implemented. Thank you. Thank you. So I'm getting signs that we absolutely have to um, wrap up. <laughs> Thank you so much for joining this panel. Please join me in applauding our panelists here. Um, I think one one takeaway is unfortunately that there's still uh, a lot to be left done. I think this was one of the first sessions that actually addressed this issue, um, like practically here at the IGF. And I think that um, maybe uh, all of you could uh, connect um, also informally and see uh, where you can continue this discussion um, and in which fora. Thank you.